Welcome to our weekly compilation, where we look at some of the most surprising and jaw-dropping situations created by spoiled brats, secrets that people keep to themselves, and people's hidden secrets. So sit back, relax, and prepare to be surprised and delighted by life's unexpected twists and turns. Remember to like and subscribe. When have you seen a spoiled brat getting owned? Viewer's Edition. Story 1. All the ones on Spoiled College Kids makes me remember my freshman year college roommate. She was a massive B. She was the type that blew through her allowance so fast, which was like $1,000 a week for reference. I got like $250 every two weeks. And when mom or dad wouldn't give her any more, she would whine and complain to grandma or auntie until they gave her an extra thousand dollars. She also had multiple boyfriends and would stay up late loudly talking to them on video calls, and if they ignored her for a single second, she would whine and cry that they didn't love her. And she always told each boy they were her one and only while I'm just zipping up my bed tent and trying to get some sleep. Also, I got injured pretty early in the semester, got rear-ended at a red light at 40 miles per hour, leaving my first and only marching band performance at a football game. And while I didn't break anything, I had major muscle strains, which looming back were also prob which looking back were also probably some EDS supplications as well, down my whole back to the point where I could barely leave my bed. I missed so many clashes, I pretty much flunked the semester. The muscle strains made it near impossible to sing for choir, and I had to drop marching band completely because my director made me keep coming to games, even though all I could do was just sit holding my trombone. Of course, I couldn't hold it up to play it. During all of that, she would always claim my side of the room was trashed when there were a few things scattered on the floor and she would be at me in person and overtaxed that I was lazy and it wasn't that hard to clean. Once I got a new car, she pretty much used me as a free taxi service and me being a people pleaser just did it. She did eventually get humbled by her own hit of the real world, but even I thought it was a horrible way of it happening. One day she asked me if one of her arms looked more swollen than the other, and it did. She kept saying she thought she just pulled a muscle at the gym, but I kept telling her it felt warmer and she should probably go to the ER. She said she couldn't because her insurance only covered facilities in California. We were in Nevada. So she booked a last-minute flight home, and I dropped her off at the airport, honestly worried about her. I didn't like her, but I could tell this seemed serious. She was gone a few weeks, and I think finally came back after Thanksgiving break. Turns out she had some sort of defect around her collarbone that pressed on some blood vessels and gave her a axillosubclavian vein thrombosis. Yes, I had to look that up. Turns out she was gone for so long because she pretty much needed surgery as soon as she got home, which the doctors were not happy that she had to fly to get home. And some small things didn't go right, so she needed two following surgeries as well. She also had to go on a ton of blood thinners. When she got back to school, she had like two types of pills and some sort of shot she had to do daily to get her blood thin enough to not cause another clot. I don't remember much after this whole ordeal because, like I said, it humbled her a lot, and while we still didn't get along very well, she was at least a lot more tolerable. I was still very glad when the end of the school year came and I went home for the summer. Got to go back to school in the next year and be part of the first year there was an LGBTQ plus special interest floor. Honestly, the best dorm experience ever. I mean, honestly, viewer... I'm just genuinely more interested in your experience. Like, I mean, yeah, this person got a little bit humbled, and I'm glad that they turned out to be okay, and, you know, hopefully they've grown into just a better and better person, but I mostly was stuck on feeling bad for you getting in an accident like that, and, like, when you mess up your back, that is just... that changes your life for a period. That is really rough to kind of get through. So you have my sympathies, but... Also, that sounds really cool being on that, you know, first year of an LGBTQ plus special interest floor. That's awesome. And I, you know, this is a story I'm genuinely interested in hearing more. So, hey. Story two. Maybe I'm the odd one, but I was learning to cook at age two. Mopping the floor with a custom mop at two. Sweeping with a child-sized real broom at age two. Assisting with the laundry at age two. Cleaning a cat's litter box at age two. Doing dishes at age two. All with supervision of both grandparents. My late grandmother taught me to sew and bake before I entered kindergarten. I made my own lunches for a while before the Catholic elementary school I had to attend started being that my grandmother needed to let me be a child and do childish things with friends. Friends? What are those? 
My entire neighborhood was either families that had kids on the verge of high school, families with toddlers, or families that were brand new. What the F was I supposed to play with? The neighborhood bully? Yeah, no thanks. Just before Canadian Thanksgiving 1988, my third grade teacher decided she was going to have a Thanksgiving lunch and invited us to bring in some dishes to catch as we third graders with help had to make them. Uh, they were not to be store-bought, they were not to come from any bakery, they had to be made from scratch. I took in 50 scratch-made mini pies, 10 apple, 10 pumpkin, 10 rhubarb, uh, using the canned pie filling, still good, 10 cherry, and 10 chocolate pies using the cupcake tin. I took in scratch-made biscuits, I took in scratch-made cake, and several scratch-made big pies of the same variety of the little pies. And what does the educational assistant say when she sees everything in airtight Tupperware containers? You do realize you were supposed to bake those yourselves and not purchase them from the store, right? So I said, yep, give me a minute and you'll see everything is scratch made. Carried all the boxes into the classroom and put them on the table, took the lids off the containers to reveal many scratch made tarts, pies, cookies, biscuits, and turnovers. It was the last time she ever reminded me that things were supposed to be scratch made. I can cook, I can clean, I can bake, I can sew God knows how many times I sewed a gray beat up formerly squeaky hedgehog for my late shih tzu until at last I had to sell him, tell him Spike, went to the big garden in the sky. So he went and beat the ever-loving crap out of every single squeaky lamb chop he owned. God, I miss my baby boy who was over-vaccinated in 2020 because he missed two years of shots due to mommy, me, not having enough money to one, pay tenant insurance, two, pay cable and phone, three, get groceries to last a month before running out. At the time, my mom kept promising she'd take me to the food bank for the first time, then I would back out if it was cloudy, windy, misty, too hot, too cold, or someone was coming over late. I got peed one day and went to the food bank myself and came across idiots when I went into the grocery store who thought that one person equals six boxes of KD meant that you could take 16 boxes. No, one person can take six boxes, not 16 boxes for one person. I've got to say... Not at all in line with the prompt, but you sound like a really interesting person, and I love that. Making all that stuff from scratch at that age and everything, that's really awesome. I wish I'd gotten more into cooking when I was even younger, because I'm super into like cooking and baking now. I love doing that stuff. I make stuff from scratch every day if I can, but uh, I didn't get into it until like my mid to late 20s kind of is when I actually started doing real stuff. So that's really awesome. And uh, even if this wasn't related to the prompt, it was still just kind of a cool story about you. So neat. Story three. I ended up dating the spoiled brat from my sister's high school like five years after they'd both graduated. In school, I guess she was your stereotypical princess whose parents got her whatever she wanted, but towards the end of her freshman year, she got knocked up by one of the stupidest people from the school. She had the kid sophomore year and her parents offered to raise the kid so she could focus on school, but she used the freedom to keep partying. By the time I hooked up with her, she'd had a second kid with another dude who'd gotten killed in a drunk driving incident and was living off an insurance settlement. First month or so was okay, but she slowly showed her true colors over the next several months, and she was pretty much a still self-absorbed wannabe princess who blamed all of her problems, like her weight gain, on everyone else except herself. Why'd I date her? Well, I was in the middle of a downward spiral that saw me lose almost everything and then wasn't making many smart decisions back then. Thankfully, I'm in a much better place now. Story 4. Ooh, for the makeup story, that reminds me of a night I had while working at Walmart. Passed one aisle in electronics to see a woman had opened something like seven boxes of chargers to find out which one connected properly to her phone and how long they were. I projected authority, my bottom of the rung butt does not really possess, lol, and told her she'd have to pay for them all or repackage them all back up the way they go on the shelves. She did comply, but was mumbling about how was she supposed to know without trying them. Then she got a bit frustrated when one of them had a more complex folding design and she was having trouble with it. I was so happy to take it from her, meticulously close it, and mention how it was unfair for us employees to have to do it every day when customers leave them lying open or worse, have to write them off if we can't repackage them. And then I looked her dead in the eye and said, it's not a good argument to say you were trying them out. You don't take a bite out of the food and decide you don't want to buy it after all, right? Her look of shame had me feeling good that entire month.
Story 5. My dad and I used to work at a high-end gaming equipment store, though it was mostly dealing with antique restorations. A lot of rich parents would buy dartboards, pool tables, foosball, air hockey, and shuffleboards, and game accessories for their kids for good grades and good behavior, etc. One family went all out with it and probably spent close to 100000 on all those items. We get invited to his opening night along with the rich neighbors and other rich friends. One of the kids thought he was a bad butt because he was beating siblings at eight balls. Later, it's time to make room for the actual players. He gets in on it. First person lets the kid in. Before the start, he says, we're going to do this game straight style. First person to a number of balls. Kid thinks it's easy because there are no stripes or solids. My dad gets up to him. He lets the kid break, then pulls out his cue with solid gray inlay and leather grip. Brat says to his dad, why didn't you get one of those for me, holding a $100 stick. Kid is a good sport at first, gives congratulatory handshakes and says good game. Later, beaten again and again. After 10 straight losses, he says he's taking a break. On the way there, he blames his dad for embarrassing him. His dad tries to cool it down, saying, see, I can't be these guys either. Then, says his dad rigged it so he'd, the dad, would lose and it's not going to make him feel better. He leaves and can hear him breaking stuff on the stairs and kicking holes in the wall. We pretend to hear nothing even though the party is mostly silent listening to him. He then throws his cue stick through the wall. Brat's younger sister says, forget about him, he's always like that when he loses. Exactly what we do. Then hear him getting yelled at in the back for embarrassing the family. Nothing will stop him. He smashed a windshield with the bottom of a cue stick. Dad just says, keep doing that, it's coming out of your money. He then hits his dad with the cue stick. Dad takes it and says he's done. Dad gets rid of the table and donates it to his school. It's a private upper class smaller school, so everyone knows why the game room equipment is there. Oh, I gotta say, I had just like... My brain broke for a moment when this kid apparently smashed a windshield with this cue stick. And the dad's like, well, that's coming out of your money. It's like, that kid has money to, like, pay for that kind of stuff? Like, he's money for all this other stuff. And it it all connected in my brain. But it took a moment where I'm like, what, what child has this? Why would a child have this? Why would you, what led this child to be this way? And... Uh, I don't know, but I hope he's doing better now. Most shocking thing a quiet kid has said, viewer's edition. Story one! I was a quiet kid in high school. In the study hall, we had table groups, so people usually just group up with people they know or just tolerate, you know? I was with three chatty girls next to me and a guy in front of me. They would always talk about their life, drama, boyfriends, etc., while I had headphones with music, only like after a month or so, and drew in my notebooks. Note, I don't know if anyone else's brain does this, but my brain, or I guess my subconscious, just sucks in information from around me and I just remember it. Kind of freaks some people out around me because they think I'm not listening because of the headphones with music and, you know, quiet kid. Also, according to my stepdad, I'm too silent and that I scare him without meaning to. Use that skill for Halloween, which also has a lot of stories about me volunteering at a haunted house. We didn't acknowledge each other and waited for the one hour to leave. Many months and many stories later, I had left my headphones uncharged the night before and just started drawing with them on. It was the small ones. My mind had no music to occupy itself, so started to vacuum in the sounds around me, especially the gossip of the girls next to me. They started telling a story and said something funny, so I smirked, and the girl across from me on my left saw and motioned for the other girls to stop, then asked me if I had been listening in. I said yes. Then they asked if I had listened to all their stories, and I said yes, but I didn't mean to, and apologized, but they didn't believe me, so I retold a story they said a few weeks prior. They were a bit surprised, amazed, and nervous that they now know that I had been listening in on their stories, that they all looked at each other with open mouths for a few seconds. The dude in front of me, to whom I had little to few conversations with, asked me, why don't you just not listen in on them? Or something along those lines, not verbatim. And I replied, why do you think I use headphones? And the girls started laughing at that. Made me smile for a while after that. I have a lot of stories about being a quiet kid in high school who only had three friends that I talked to for all four years, although I did talk to others, but mostly those three friends of mine. I'm thinking I should start posting them on here just as the story where I terrified the students and security guards accidentally because of my clothing that day and made them slightly think that I might do something 
bad, but was a choice made from actions the night before that had to do a lot of temporary Christmas tattoos, but I don't know. Well, I don't know what the heck was happening at the end there with the Christmas tattoos, but... Uh, it certainly sounds interesting, and I wouldn't mind hearing that story. And also, yeah, I'm sorry, folks. Even if someone has, like, headphones in or they're reading or whatever, if you're just talking around them constantly at, like, a reasonable volume, people are going to hear you. If you don't want to be heard, don't have conversations by people, I guess. I don't know. Like, I can't help but overhear conversations sometimes, even when I'm trying not to. So, yeah. Story 2. I was always the quiet kid at school from elementary to high school. I always stayed quiet when wanted to pay attention in class and get my work done, and always turn it in on time. Tip for freshmen, always do your homework in the class you were given it and finish it in there so that way you'll have free time to do it at home. Trust me, it's foolproof. I remember I said something that... Uh, usually likes me, but I think it was when I was in history class, and we went to the library to do book research. I love to read books, mostly a huge book nerd, and I'm still am along with a D&D &D online game nerd, but anyways, I was assigned with three people. Two of them didn't know what to do or what part of the assignment they wanted to do, but me, and we'll call him Mark, Mark already had something already in mind, and split it in half and go research by book, cause for our history project in class, we had the presidents, and what they did for a living before they became presidents. I did George Washington, and Mark did maybe one of the presidents that became fourth or fifth president, and had either no education or did, but anyways, as me and Mark were doing our book research on the presidents, we put these two guys, Matthew and Jack, not really their names, to do the project slide. They never did when we had to show it on the day it was due. And when I asked them about it, they said, Oh, sorry, we forgot. And I was angry, and so was Mark, but I'd stayed quiet a lot and then spoke. Maybe if you bozos weren't on your phone playing game then when we were in the library of a book research, then use computers, we would have been finished by now. But no, you idiots just decided to mess around and put people's grades at risk. You are lucky the teacher is here, or I would have kicked your butt right now. And then I asked to use the bathroom. I don't remember what happened next, but I know that those two must have had a scolding and had their phones taken away, that is for sure. And I and Mark were sitting away from them and everyone just stared at me like I killed someone. But yeah, that was pretty much it. The first thing I'll say is, let me tell you, there's plenty of us in high school who our classes did not give us any time to do homework in class. You had to take all that crap home. And so the only real choice was to do what I did and don't do homework and let it affect your grades. Uh, second, cool that you like D&D. &D. Uh, I like tabletop games as well, if you can't tell. <laughs> and, uh... Yeah, no, I don't blame you for speaking up, because uh, those guys sound like a bunch of dongs. Story 3. I was the quiet kid. Not completely silent or anything, but I never really said anything to anyone other than asking the teacher for something. One day I was in my AP World History class, the last class of the day, sophomore year of high school. There was this guy behind me who was always joking around. Nice guy, everyone liked him, but he tended to take up a decent amount of class time with his jokes, and since almost every day we had to complete a group project by the end of the period, he tended to waste a chunk of class time. Every minute mattered when it came to classwork since almost everyone didn't finish until maybe a minute before the period ended, and this was on a good day, so yeah, kinda annoyed me. Anyway, it's a random day and I've had a really long day and am very much just wanting to get the school day over with. I tended to work alone in all the group projects, again, quiet kid no one talked to. So the combination of me being tired, knowing I have a long butt project to finish in 45 minutes, and one I was going to be doing alone meant I had zero tolerance for this guy's crap. He starts joking around with our teacher like usual, and it's been about two minutes of this, usually it goes about five minutes total, all through the teacher's instructions, and I finally had enough and turn around and blatantly tell him to shut up so we can get our instructions and get to work. Everyone was shocked for a second or two, but my teacher just rolled with it and gave us our instructions. I finished the day and left with little fanfare, but apparently that day left an impact for the guy. He still joked around a lot, but he seemed to have a crap ton of respect for me, as the following year I joined our school's youth and government program, and we ended up going on a trip to the Capitol together since he was also in the program. After a long day of presenting oral arguments, we all got on the bus, and the guy proceeds to tell the story of how I once told him to shove it to the rest of our group, which once again surprised people, other than my argument partner who I'd become pretty chatty with. But suddenly everyone seemed to think I was pretty cool. 
The guy and I became semi-friends after that, and I still preferred to be alone, but he was one of the few people I'd actually talk to. Story 4. Back in 6th grade, middle school where I'm from, there was this really quiet girl, barely said anything to anyone except her few friends and answering teachers. She had the weird habit of making weird gurgling sounds that honestly sounded like she was being possessed. Anyway, toward the end of 6th grade, she started coining herself. It is a thing practiced in some Asian cultures where you rub a coin up and down a body part extremely fast. It left these huge red marks and there were many open wounds. The teacher asked her what happened because she was bleeding and she proceeded to tell the teacher, I've coined myself. She had a creepy grin. It's wonderful. They're gone. Apparently, this is practiced to remove demons from your skin. We went to a private Catholic school at the time. Week later, school ended for the year. Come back into school in seventh grade and this girl's eyes have a blank look, like she always stared away from people. At lunch and in class, I saw her ripping her skin open with staples. Teachers never did anything. Found out later she had a very traumatic time growing up. Nobody ever noticed anything was wrong because she was always talking about Minecraft. Turns out Minecraft and the videos were her comfort in the trauma. After we left middle school, I never saw her again until recently. She now works at a local school and her arms are covered in scars and more from middle school. Sucks knowing I could have helped the girl, but I never really noticed. And it wasn't like she was bullied. She had a habit of it someone insulted, bullied, etc. She would tell them the whole life story of a serial killer. Never the same one, either. Girl was really smart, but super creepy. I mean, this is a good thing to keep in mind that sometimes, you know, folks who might seem a little odd or quiet or something might be dealing with stuff at home or something, some trauma or something like that. So... You know, no reason to be mean to them or anything. And, you know, it sounds like you were not actively mean to this person at all, which is great. And it also sounds like they might be doing better in life, which I'm happy to hear. Story 5. I was the quiet kid. I grew up on a farm and regularly helped my grandfather, who was a diesel mechanic. So I was ripped, but hid it as much as possible. I was quite shy as well. People, of course, thought I was weird. I liked the fact it seemed to make people uncomfortable. One day, while the teacher was out, the class troublemaker decided I was his target for the day. He jumped up on my desk and started acting like a hula dancer. Well, this is a desk that was connected to the chair, so I just stood up. He was immediately on the floor. He got up and flipped the desk over, knocking me and the desk into the wall. I landed hard on my back, hitting my head, but basically unhurt. I figured since everyone already thought I was a bit freaky, I would play into it. I kicked the desk away from me with both legs, tripping him, and apparently pushed back two rows of desks, and the kids went with it unhurt. I severely misjudged how much power to use. Just in time to see it happen, the teacher walked in. We were sent to the principal's office. After talking with the class for the story, the principal suspended the class clown, but not me. Unfortunately, they had suspended a critical football player on the day before homecoming day. The football team was furious, and some of them attacked me after school right in front of the superintendent and many kids. I don't know how, but I put two of four of them in the hospital and significantly hurt the other two. I had a couple of bruises, but most of the pain I had was from overexertion going absolutely all out in defense mode. Them or me, and I wasn't going to go easy. Well, after the police investigation and everything, I was back in school the next Monday. I had some teachers and classmates mad at me for ending the football season for the school. Some were on my side and happy the jocks got put in their place, but after that, nobody wanted to provoke me again. I continued being a mostly quiet person until graduation. I felt a lot more accepted by most of the class. Many more would willingly interact, and I was even asked to a few parties. Later, I found out that it was partly intimidation, so people behaved themselves. But now I'm old, and that was decades ago. Story 6 as the quiet kid, I never really understood what was so weird about me being quiet. I was in study hall in 8th grade, and I was doing a reading assignment. The kids around me wouldn't stop talking. Not that I'm making excuses, but I'm dyslexic, so it was already hard enough to read. It got so bad that the teacher left the room real quick to cool off. She was gone for a few minutes, but it just kept on getting worse. So I lost it. Will you all shut the F up for five minutes? I yelled. It was dead silence. The teacher came in and started laughing. Well, that's a feat. I barely hear Lily talk, and y'all made her yell. My friend beside me proceeded to make it worse by saying, Oh, that's not very hard. Try waking her up at 3 a.m. Yeah, 
I don't blame you. You know, if I mean, you're not supposed to be talking in study hall, right? I don't know. I never had a study hall. <laughs> but, um, yeah, you know, you, you, I mean, if you're going to talk and everything, you should at least be quiet and respect the people who actually want to use it to study and get work done. So, yeah, I don't blame you. Good call. Everyday skill that makes you look suspicious if you're too good. Viewers edition. Story one. Okay, but as an elementary age kid, I was that too good at silently walking person. Legit freaked out a girl in my class so hard by complete accident that she was too scared to come back to school the next day, all because I coincidentally happened to be in the same spot as her three times on the same day without her hearing me coming. For a couple weeks, one boy in the class tried to convince everyone I had teleportation powers. I did, it did not gain any traction. All right, we're starting off right in the bat. I can't remember if in the original video if I was critical of the people like, oh, I'm so skilled at moving around silently, but uh, I, I don't mean to be critical about it and everything. I just love it. It's like, oh, I'm so skilled at not being no <laughs> noticed, which that was me in grade school and middle school, high school. <laughs> Story two. Dealing with physical trauma. I used to be an army medic before I began working in an ER. Families look at me like I'm a sociopath because I can make their loved ones laugh over a dirty joke while I'm digging around in what used to be a leg to stop their bleeding. I can also lie to you with a straight face if you ask me if you're going to die. I can even sing while intubating someone. I mean, that might come across as a little bit creepy to some people, but I definitely want someone who is, like, working on me in an emergency medical fashion to be calm and collected. If I'm getting operated on by a surgeon who's just going, oh crap, oh crap, it's not gonna put me at ease. I'm gonna be more creeped out by that. Story three, reading body language to tell someone's mood or mental state. There's a certain point where it gets creepy. For instance, my cousin wasn't doing too well mentally and she hadn't told anyone. By the end of the night, I pull her into my room and we had a full on talk about mental health. When I told her how I knew she was freaked out because she thought she was being obvious, when I mainly got this idea by her mannerisms and the way she walks now compared to how she used to. Apparently a lot of people don't notice these things. I got her permission to post this. Story 4. Being calm is real. I think it's weirder to panic, really. Panicking almost never actually helps, so if you have to do something, then make sure you're safe first, then make sure the next person, then the next. It can save lives and it lets you do something. But yeah, I generally never panic unless an expert panics. And experts don't panic because they know what to do. Story 5. The ability to just sit calmly and quietly and just get on with whatever work I have when there's lots of loud noises around me. For years during my classes when I was younger, my classmates yelled and screamed constantly. I just learned to ignore it and tune it out. I had a friend ask me the other day how I stayed focused and looked so unbothered by the noise around us. I wasn't really sure how to explain other than I'm just used to it. I actually have something a little bit like this. Uh, I used, I at least used to be able to sleep through any noise because as a very young kid, I grew up right by some train tracks and would have to sleep when the train was going by all the time. And so then, as a, like, middle schooler, my dad and stepmom would take me to the stock car uh, races, which, if you've never been to those, are the loudest thing on earth. And I was probably the only person sitting in the stands who would fall asleep during it because I was so bored. <laughs> Story six. Apparently people say it's really suspicious with how easily I can read people on the first meeting. I've spent my life being bullied and assaulted in all forms of the word, so I've gotten used to having to read body language and vocal pitches. According to all my boyfriend's friends, it makes me seem paranoid when I really I'm just reading to make sure you don't mean to me or him any harm whatsoever. Even over video calls, I still read them based on what I can see of them. Story 7. Being good at calculus. When I look at calculus 1 through 4, I hardly missed a question. I didn't for calc 1 and calc 2 and only missed some questions in calc 3 and calc 4. Well, I decided to make a game of it and tried to finish the exams as quickly as possible. In calc 1, it took me 72 minutes to finish a 25-question final exam. The teacher thought I was cheating, so he took me to his office and asked that I do that again with a different set of 25 questions. This time, it only took me 54 seconds. 
I got great letter of recommendation from him, but he certainly kept a close eye on me for the rest of the calc sequence after that test. Story 8. Being seen as cold during times of stress is so relatable for me. When the crap hits the fan and everyone starts to panic, I just flick my mental switch and turn into a robot. Full T-800 mode. Emotionless, clinical, and efficient until the crap storm is resolved. I've saved my own life and the lives of close family and friends multiple times due to this ability combined with excellent decision making and years of MMA training. The ability to function perfectly under extreme stress? I wouldn't trade it for anything. Story 9. In school, my teachers used to give me pages upon pages of things to read and it always took everyone forever. I am an extremely fast reader, so I would always finish 10 minutes before everyone else. One time my teacher tried to embarrass me by asking me what the article or whatever was about because he thought I didn't read it, and I said a bunch of direct quotes from the passage. He was extremely surprised and thought I was cheating on reading a paper, and I got detention for a week because of it. Uh, see, I don't know that reading super fast is necessarily creepy, but it is something that I am incredibly, incredibly jealous of. Because I'm not a super fast reader for the most part, because I think maybe it comes with doing voice work and what I do and everything, but I like to read at the pace and cadence that it would be narrated. And so I can't just quickly read through. It's like, no, no, that's not how they would say it. I need to read it at the same pace that they would speak it. <laughs> and it's frustrating because sometimes I do want to read faster. Story 10, instant math answers. I don't have it anymore, but back in school, I had an innate ability to just answer a math question without even thinking about it. I thought it was really cool as I never had to struggle or work things out like other people. But once exams came up, it became the worst thing to happen to me because I couldn't explain how I knew the answers, and for some idiotic reason, you get more marks for explaining how you get an answer than actually knowing the answer. Story 11. Lying was my first thought. Also, the eavesdropping hits so different. I remember recently, though I have been in similar situations a fair few times, I was in my math lesson in school, minding my own business, doing work, and then someone several tables away asked a question about something or other that I don't remember exactly. I instantly answered her. Her friend sitting next to her was about to, and they just stared me down. I think my being male compared to them could have added to the creepy factor. Story 12. Another thing is guessing someone's fears after knowing them for just a bit. I was talking to someone I met online and we hadn't known each other for that long. We were bonding over how much we loved a certain book and a character that guessed and ate people's fears. We were guessing each other's fears and I said something very specific and sort of personal as a joke and it turns out I was right and freaked them out. Story 13. Reading people's faces and body language. I've been looked at with shock on numerous occasions when I have asked an admittedly very direct question because of something I see going through a person's head. This also has the unfortunate side effect of making people think I'm arrogant because sometimes I see things they are either not willing to admit on the spot or haven't realized about themselves. I've just learned to stay silent unless asked. I mean, honestly, that's the kind of skill that uh, it might be creepy in just personal one-on-one -on -one interactions, but that's the kind of thing that could make you a really good, I don't know, uh, detective, mentalist, something like that. But uh, it, it, there have got to be cases where that's pretty useful. Maybe not always in the best ways, but still. Story 14. I was goofing around on a call with a friend and looked up Mike the Headless Chicken, who got decapitated but lived for 18 months after that. I'm not lying when I say I glanced at the dates of birth and death for not even a second without thinking about it, and later, like an hour or two after, I still remembered it. Hell, I still remember it to this day, April 20th, 1945, and March 17th, 1947. This is a blessing and a curse because I could overhear someone's birthday and then casually mention it months later. Same with last and middle names. It freaks people out a lot. Story 15. I can read really fast, and I remember numbers very well. When I was younger, teachers would often think I was lying when I said I finished reading the pages we had to read very early in the class. That might be because my mom is a literature teacher, which made me really interested in books. It's also weird explaining why I know the Wi-Fi password after seeing it once, or remember stats about some random tree in Ohio or something. 
Story 16. The walking silently one, or just being silent in general, I can relate to for some reason. Last year I was visiting family from my mom's side for two months and my other siblings, and it was like an experience my relatives really didn't know how to deal with, because all of our cousins are young and they're quite noisy in the house. They haven't seen us since like elementary and middle school years, and we're in like high school and college years now. So when we visited, we weren't loud, we weren't running around, and we were dead silent. No noise, not even our footsteps could be heard based on what our grandparents would say. Like when my aunts took their children and my siblings somewhere, I don't remember where. I was left alone on the second floor of my laptop I brought with me. I sat in the same spot for like three hours, not moving from the spot, and when my grandpa walked in to check on me, I was just sitting there quietly. He wasn't even sure anyone was up here. When everyone came back, it was just talk about me being silent the entire time, not needing anything for a couple hours. I guess it's understandable because our cousins are like elementary young, so it's loud and noisy. But when we were around, we were just quiet. Too quiet, apparently, that it's just not normal for them to not have to worry about their grandkids, niece, or nephews sitting quietly upstairs. I don't know if that's so much the same as a lot of other folks where they're like, oh, I'm just very good at being very quiet and sneaking up on people, you know, especially when you're like a little bit taller person like me. People don't expect you to suddenly just be behind them and they're like, oh, geez, uh, I do enjoy doing that to folks. It's fun. Um, but you just sound like you're eerily well behaved or were eerily well behaved as a child. And that is kind of creepy. Good job. Story 17. I've been hunting since I was really young, self-taught, so the only technique I had was walking super quietly. My family got used to it pretty quickly, but when I worked in an office after college, I had to form a habit of knocking on open doors or tables as I walked in the room because I get scared super easily when I startle someone. I get scared more than them. Story 18, that unintentional memorization, though. I remembered for four years the combo to my friend's combination lock at school. He forgot it one time, and I told him what it was. He tried it, and of course it unlocked, and he gave me this weird look. I lied and told him that he had told me one time because he needed me to fetch something from his locker. Well, in reality, I saw him put the combo in one time by accident. Teachers, how do you know a child is a sociopath? Viewer's edition. Story 1. I had a similar situation in my childhood. I wanted to get help, but the first few times I tried, it only made things a hundred times worse, so if I ever confessed what was going on, I'd beg the other person not to call authorities or anything like that. Mostly I just asked for places to go where I could loiter around for longer periods of time and ways to get food and water without money. Social services got involved way too many times, and they always closed the case even when I gathered photo and video evidence because it wasn't enough to prove anything, despite some photos containing blood and other disturbing elements, and some videos being absolutely horrible. I actually started trying to get help again when I realized this was affecting my sibling's mental health in a really dangerous way. I'd learned to internalize a lot of the way abuse changed me, but my sibling's was like a few of the sociopath kids this video talks about. They weren't violent and didn't understand that the way they were being treated was not okay to act out on other kids and adults. Cases continued to get completely dropped even when I was no longer fighting for myself because the abusers constantly lied, including crying and sob stories about how I, a nerdy little kid with people-pleasing tendencies at the time, was the abusive one. Always, always be very suspicious if a child is reaching out for help and the people they're accusing are giving you a sob story. Listen to kids. Convince the adults you have dropped the case but investigate further and have private conversations with the child. Ask them what's going on, what they think will help, and if they have any evidence. Hell, teach them how to record evidence. Worst case scenario, the kid is lying and now knows how to record evidence if something bad actually does happen to them or someone else. Best case scenario, you have the chance to save or drastically change the life of a child for the better. But want to know the worst case scenario? If you just leave immediately, believe whomever they're accusing, death for them.
Seriously, do you all think abusive parents, teachers, priests, whatever, cannot lie and manipulate? If the kid says they're being beaten or yelled at every single day or told they're worthless, stupid, disgusting, should never have been born all the time, do you really truly believe that that same adult who can do such disgusting things to a child cannot easily lie and manip manipulate you? Awful crap. Absolutely awful. It's true. I think uh, I might have brought up the point in the video that these comments are from uh, that a lot of these children just seem to be in need and dealing with trauma and stuff like that. And I'll also say, I know the last video, the thread we've taken this from, refers to these kids as sociopaths, but I also know that that's not really the correct term here. They're using it as a catch-all term for troubled kids who are, you know, for just a whole bunch of things. And so try and keep all those things in mind. But yeah, there are definitely some stories here about kids who might have certain, you know, problems, maybe even be sociopaths. Who knows? But there are also plenty that they're just kids in need. And I don't really think I need to add to everything that uh, this commenter said here. Well put. Story two. Yeah, high school is a seriously stressful time for a lot of kids, especially those that have been singled out. They can suffer all kinds of abuses from kids that, despite their cruelty, somehow manage to have close friends and romantic partners who see them as nice, friendly, even kind and understanding. And the loners will likely see enough to know that the very people that deliberately torture them are viewed this way. In an environment like that, resentment is easy to develop, along with a broad range of other dark emotions. For many, there can seem no safe way to cope that won't harm others except to remind oneself that it'll all be over, and most, if not all, will find themselves on fairly equal footing. Sadly, the bitterness does linger, as do the scars left by bullies' abuses. There's a reason that Japan, a nation with a very serious bullying problem, has among its adult entertainment a rather large branch, branch of fiction centered on bully victims gaining the upper hand and turning the bullies into toys with which they can do whatever they want. Sure, some are clearly designed to cater to the sadists who just want a framing device for their desires, but from what I know of the stuff that's out there, a lot seems to aim much more precisely at those that have felt like toys and slaves who just want to see their persecutors experience some pain for themselves. Story 3. Sometimes suffering kids are misunderstood. I have the story where there was a weird kid who would always go into fights and issues, one day, the weird kid just got into a fist fight with another kid, and the principal, an elderly woman, managed to de-escalate the situation in a way that I get to know what a true educator is. She started talking the weird kid out of beating the other kid, and he was very unnaturally angry and trying to look mean, and she said she would not allow him to go to the other kid and resume the fight. Then the kid said he would punch her slash hurt her if she stood in the way. And everyone got scared because it was a big, strong kid, despite being like 12 years old, and she was a very fragile, elderly woman. She then approached the angry kid and got her face very close to the kid's face and said, Then do it. Hurt me. The kid approached his fist in her face, and she didn't move. She kept her face near his fist. Meanwhile, everyone was scared in the background of what could happen. The kid then started shaking, and it was like all the anger left him, and she said, I know you can't. That's because you are not evil. You are good. You are a good person. The kid then collapsed, crying, and said how he had no friends, the bullying was bad, and he had just lost his mother. Since then, comforted the kid and told him some warm words no one would say to him. This was like 10 years ago. The kid today is in college and is one of the chillest guys I know. I think this story is another great example of just a kid dealing with trauma, but in a bad way because they don't know how to deal with it in another way because they're a kid. And the way that this principal approached that, you know, with humanity and nonviolence was brilliant and might have saved this kid. That literally might have been a turning point that helped this kid turn around. And now they're in college and they're a chill person and that's wonderful. I'm not saying that nonviolence is always 100% the answer. I don't, I, I don't know. I genuinely don't know. Um, 
But I think that there are definitely times where it's not considered where it should be. So glad that this one turned out this way. Story four. Not a teacher, but I have a strong sense that my brother is a sociopath. When he was in preschool, I caught him beating a friendly gray cat with a metal bar, even though the cat was just standing at his feet and meowing at him. He's 13 now and has put his hands on a female classmate inappropriately, tried to blame it on his friend, but it was caught on camera. He has shown no remorse for his actions. He constantly threatens our siblings, pets, anything that slightly upsets him. And he's as two-faced as a coin. Story 5. The only specific story I can remember is that at 7 or 8 years old, I'm pretty sure he pulled a knife on someone. There are plenty of other stories I've heard, but I can't think of them off the top of my head. He lives with his mother, and his home life sucks from what I know. She smokes weed around him and her other children, and God knows how many she has now. She doesn't make sure he goes to school, and I wouldn't be surprised if things like the knife incident were a learned behavior. I have no idea how she still has custody of her kids, to be honest, and how my sister and her boyfriend haven't yet been able to get full custody of him. From what I've heard, they've been trying, and he even sometimes calls my sister mom. Story 6. Sociopath is being mistaken for psychopath in most of these stories. Psychopaths mostly enjoy the pain they cause, love having power over others, animals, or people, have no sense of guilt, and are very manipulative. Sociopaths lack empathy to varying degrees, have a hard time picking up facial and social cues and body language, difficulty understanding personal boundaries, but do feel guilt and are generally neutral to kind people in most cases. People tend to mix up the two disorders and then use them interchangeably. There's the obvious negative stigma for those who suffer from psychopathy, and this then also negatively affect those who suffer from sociopathy. This can make people hesitant to get diagnosed or seek treatment. There are some with psychopathy who do seek treatment in order to help them maintain healthy, non-toxic relationships with others. Deep down, some of them aren't bad people, but their brains are wired in a way that mistakenly releases feel-good chemicals when they do bad things. Of course, this leads to very negative consequences that most people don't like, so they seek treatment to better themselves. Ah, hey, there we go. Uh, we have someone who's bringing up that uh, a sociopath is being mistaken for a psychopath. And as I said, even in some of these stories, sociopath is just being tossed around for any troublesome kid that might be dealing with trauma and anything. So, as I've said, take the people's use of that term from the thread that we've taken it from. And even in these comments, take it with a grain of salt. I'm not uh, licensed in any way to diagnose anyone either way on this. And so I think that's something we all need to keep in mind. So good comment. Story seven. I am not a teacher, but this was in kindergarten when halfway through the year we got a new student. Right from the start, this kid gave off the vibe that this kid didn't care about anyone but himself. He would constantly try to disrupt class and encourage other students to do the same. This kid also had really bad anger issues and would throw fits all the time, but not little ones. He would tear the classroom apart and scream, even pushing over a bookshelf and almost hitting a kid. I had one experience directly with the kid, and it still gives me an uneasy feeling thinking about it. It was like any normal day back at school. I went in and started the day just fine and had no interactions with this kid. Recess time comes around. I remember for some reason I decided to go lay down on the ground near the outer edge of the playground. This playground had a fence to keep kids in since it was connected to the school like a lot of kindergartens were. Around the fence were big softball to football sized rocks. As I'm lying there, I see this kid walking up next to me, and I thought, hmm, strange, wonder what he wants. Next thing I knew, the kid picks up one of those big rocks, looks me dead in the eye, smiling, says nothing, and just drops this rock on my head for no reason. All I remember from there was me crying and my dad picking me up while I held a butterfly ice pack the school gave me on my head. Worst of all, every day this kid got picked up a little earlier than everyone else, and when his mom came in to get him, he instantly starts saying, Mom, Mom, I was good today. I was a good boy. I deserve a donut. The school was right across from a 7-Eleven, and I guess this kid gets a donut after school if he's good. He did not deserve that donut, and it seems the teacher never said anything to his parents about how much he was misbehaving like he knew he could get away with anything. I still won't forget the smile he gave me before dropping a massive rock on my head. Downright gives me chills and makes me wonder where he is today. Ugh, 
See, I hate to hear about this stuff because who knows where this kid is getting it from. I mean, some kids just don't understand boundaries like that and just need some guidance. But it sounds like this parent is just kind of believing this kid. The other authorities at that school, teachers and stuff, aren't telling the parent. Like, it feels like the ball is being dropped all over. And if things don't get corrected, that, that kid, you know... Who knows what he's doing today, but it might not be great. How did you realize you were dating a dumb butt? Viewer's edition. Story one. I thought about dating this girl from college for a while. She was always hanging out with us, and we had plenty of common interests. She said, no, I just took it in stride. We stayed friends and still are friends, but God, how lucky I am to dodge that bullet. Three stories. One, she claims she used to run all the time, that she had a fast mile time, and running helps her deal with stress. I said that we should run some time together. We go to a, out to the football field for a quick mile. What follows was the saddest attempt at a light jog I'd ever seen. Firstly, she doesn't make it an eighth of the track before she needs to stop, claiming she's about to faint. She has the most geriatric running form I'd ever seen, crunching her stomach and chest downward and inward as she goes. She squeezes her butt cheeks and tucks her tailbone in and makes it look like she just cracked her pants. Her feet swing wider than they're supposed to swing forward. She runs with one hand on her shoulder. I asked her why she runs that way and she just casually said, it's how you're supposed to run. I try to correct her, and she actually starts to do better, but then she tells me she's about to faint. Turns out, she was about to faint because, get this, she didn't think that she was supposed to breathe hard while running. If you're wondering, no, she doesn't have any kind of condition, she's just an idiot. The second required a bit of context. When playing the guitar, there's a thing you can do where you press down on a string and run your finger across it. I think it's called legato. Anyway, we both play casually. I'm trying to teach her how to play Jack Johnson's Upside Down. In this song, legato is a key part. It is literally as simple as running your finger across a line if you can press hard enough. However, she seems to think the only way to do it is to lift your finger from the string and press it on each fret individually. This is as wrong as being told to walk left and then proceeding to walk right. I literally explained it to her for upwards of 20 minutes using terminology a four-year-old could understand, demonstrating it literally right before her eyes, having her specific name, the differences between the actions that she's doing and the action that I'm doing and confirming with her which is the correct one. Nothing. She doesn't understand why it doesn't work and why she can't play the song. Lastly, the concept of a Mary Sue is all that completely lost on her. We both like to write. She would occasionally share her stories with me, claim they were 100% original, and that she knows this one is going to be the next Harry Potter or something. She's currently writing a story about a detective that gets involved in court activity. Hilarious part is not only is she a Mary Sue, but it's basically the exact same plot of Choo Choo Charles. And when I bring this up, her only defense is back and forth between, but the plot is different because the main character is a woman, and mine is grounded in realism because the cults don't actually have any magic because magic doesn't exist. So many things about what she was saying just annoyed me. Nice girl, but a total idiot. I'm going to say that th these three examples don't tell me that she is a total idiot. It tells me that she has areas that she's, you know, maybe not as skilled in. But I've also always, you know, there are many types of intelligence. Different people are smart about different things. For instance, I could point out a whole bunch of grammar errors that you made, because I'm kind of good at that, because I went to school for it and everything. It, you know, and granted, you're writing fast. That's, that's not a... That is not an accurate judgment of how smart you are as a person. Much like I don't think these instances are necessarily uh, a total indicator of how smart she is. So, uh, but they do make for some amusing stories. So, glad you shared. Story two. I was thinking about dating a girl, let's call her Ashley, and before I asked Ashley out, I was getting to know her. Ashley was homeschooled and I was curious about it. I asked her if she had studied geometry yet. She said, oh yeah, I love maps. I laughed because I thought she was kidding and she just gave me this confused look. I later found out that Ashley's dad was under investigation for once selling fake cancer meds and was making $10,000 a month consulting for his pharmaceutical company that he sold to another company that was aware that the meds were bogus. 
He got a nominal fine and 200 hours of community service. What a bunch of BS. Anyway, I guess her parents had more on their mind than school at the time and just let their kids study whatever they wanted. Also, as an aside, my now wife told me a story about how Ashley's sister, let's call her Elise, had gotten angry at my wife's sister once and had crushed a Christmas ornament into my wife's sister's head. This just gets weirder. I'd briefly dated Elise and totally believe my wife because Elise had anger management issues. Oh, and her dad did too. Yelled at a kid that played with his slate chess set and quite literally gently placed a piece on the board when it just broke in half. You could have super glued it back together and you wouldn't have been able to tell the difference. Anyway, that guy was crazy. He ran a private church with all the money he was making and taught all of his followers that people are inherently evil and that he could absolve them of their sins if they gave him his money. Just an all-around winner, that guy. I mean, I, I don't actually have anything bad to say about Ashley. She, you know, misunderstood, you know, she mixed up geometry and geography. Um, <laughs> uh, the story is much more about apparently her very awful parents and some crap her sister did or something. But, uh, I don't know. Ashley seems fine. Uh, she, she seems fine for what she, for the family she had to deal with. Story three, my late wife worked with a 19-year-old woman who asked, what happens to the sun at night? Quick as a flash, an older, snarky colleague said, they put it in a box until morning. The 19-year-old totally accepted this. Story four, she was a friend of a woman I was dating, but she was all kinds of special. I was in the army at the time, and we were having a Waffle House feast. I mentioned that I expected to get transferred soon and had put West Germany at the top of my preference sheet. This girl immediately breaks out in tears and cries that I can't go to Germany, the Nazis will kill me. A few questions later, we realized she thought World War II was still going on. This was in 1986. Story 5 I wasn't dating him, thankfully, but one time I casually mentioned the seven continents. My dad interrupted me to correct me that there were, in fact, eight of them. So, confused and hoping he was drunk, I said, no, there's only seven, and he dramatically asks me to name them. Now, there are so many things wrong here, but the main one is that he's the one with an extra, so by all rights, the burden of proof is on him. Also, this was before I had ever heard about Lemuria or splitting Oceania into Australia and Zealandia or anything like that. But that wasn't what he was talking about anyhow. So I start listing them off. North and South America, Africa, Antarctica, Australia, Asia, Europe. And he stops me, looking smug like a cat who just ate a canary. He asks, why are Europe and Asia separate continents? And honestly, I don't know. I've often asked that question myself, and I've never gotten a good answer. You'd think, if anything, it'd be India. That's the one that's on a different tectonic plate, but I digress. So that's where the conversation ended. He had talked me down to six continents, I guess. And he was treating that like a victory, even though it was the exact opposite of the position he held. I really, really hope he was drunk. Ugh. Ah! This one hurts my head so much. God dang it. Like, I know folks who, where they get into an argument with you, and it doesn't even become about, like, proving themselves right. Just so long as they, like, think they've proven you wrong, then they win? I don't know. And also, Asia and Europe are different because that's where the line in the map is. <laughs> I don't know why either. Story 6. Some of these just happen to be that instance where you've gone your whole life without encountering that little fact you have a misunderstanding over. Like, my family and I were visiting a museum and they had beautiful tapestries depicting unicorns. In the corner of the room, they had a narwhal tusk to sort of take the place of the unicorn horn. When my aunt saw it, she got confused. She thought that narwhals, like unicorns, were a myth. I had to explain through my laughter that narwhals are indeed real, and they are sometimes called the unicorns of the sea. Story 7. A lot of people have weird blind spots in their knowledge. It can happen to anyone. The ideal response when these situations come up is to politely correct the person and encourage them to learn more. If you laugh at them, you're training them to avoid saying anything around you. In which case, their blind spots will never be revealed and you'll never have a chance to correct them. Or worse, you'll make them get defensive about their intelligence, making them more likely to lash out at you if you try to correct them. 
Story 7 gets it. This commenter knows what's up. People have blind spots in their knowledge. I have blind spots. Do you have any idea how long I was using the word disconcerning instead of disconcerting? Because they sound similar enough, but eventually a friend heard me is just like, do you mean disconcerting? And I was like, what? What? Like, everyone's got blind spots. It's fine. Uh, my problem comes when there are the people who are wrong, but become like kind of belligerent or snobby about it. Like they're j you try and like nicely correct them and they're like, uh-uh, I'm correct. And then you're like, all right, well now I'm going to tell people about this because you're being kind of a brat. But yeah, for the most part, everybody, everybody's got some area where they're, you know, an idiot. I sure do. Story 8. Not a date, but my sister. We were hanging out when I saw a dead pigeon on the side of the road, and I said, Look, a dead pigeon! To which she replied, looking toward the sky, Where? Where? I do feel sorry for her boyfriend, though. Story 9. Maybe it was when she insisted we sit in the car in front of a destination we were already late for to listen to a particular song so she could explain how it fit into the already repeatedly proven false urban myth. Maybe it was the time she congratulated our waiter at an Outback Steakhouse for having Subaru name a car after their restaurant. Maybe it was when she lectured our waitress at an expensive restaurant for several minutes on how the chef was supposed to cook her meal. Maybe it was, uh, well, never mind. Story 10. I dated a girl in college that told me I could get electrocuted by talking on a cordless phone during a lightning storm. She also asked her black dorm mate if black people smoked. Please note, she was in an honors program and was considered an elite student. Story 11. I married, then divorced him. He went on to rant about the U.S. catering to folks who speak Spanish because the security truck at Walmart said securitas, so obviously it meant security in Spanish. I speak Spanish and had translated for a customer and a clerk at a gas station 15 minutes prior. He didn't even attempt to ask, and when I pointed out the word for security in Spanish as seguridad, he looked me in the eyes and asked me how I would know, as if I hadn't spoken Spanish in front of him 15 minutes ago. How? Why would, why would he question your knowledge of Spanish if he knows that you've spoken Spanish and he doesn't? Like, I feel, like, how how just, how? Why? Why, people? Don't do that. <laughs> Please leave your story in the comments. I would love to make a video on them in the future. Also, don't forget to like and subscribe.